Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah, Keith, just before you jump in, just uh, wanted to give you a quick introduction. So uh, joining us this evening for the presentation is Keith Thompson, who is a private lands program manager with Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation. Uh, Keith has been doing this job for a couple of years now, I believe, Keith. Um, but before taking on this, this role, Keith was a Chittenden County Forester. So uh, we're really fortunate to have him join us this evening. And like I said, uh, this is a great opportunity for, for participants, for you to listen, uh, absorb some great information, and please uh, speak up with any questions that you have for Keith as the presentation goes along. And so with that, Keith, I'll go ahead and just pass it over to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Kate. Um, thanks for the opportunity to do this presentation again. It's something I really enjoy. Uh, I've got a small property in Winooski that's less than an acre. And um, while I spend a lot of my professional life uh, out on larger parcels in my personal life, I'm uh, living on a very small parcel. And there's just a handful of trees and the opportunity to see a affiliated woodpecker um, fly through or uh, a goshawk uh, on last Wednesday was perched on that property. It's just a, a really cool thing to, to experience um, in such a relatively urban landscape. And so I, I know that small properties are a, a really big deal for our state. Um, in some ways, uh, small properties and the houses that are on them uh, are the things that divide our larger and impact forests. But another way of looking at it is that it's also the glue that holds it together and the way that smaller landowners manage their properties uh, plays a major role in, in how healthy the rest of our forest is. And so. Um, I think one of the major things that uh, one of the most important things that small landowners can do is uh, fall in love with their land and learn about it. And um, I think one of the, the most important things you can do is to be engaged on the land. And so this presentation is about projects that you can do to help you engage with your land, um, fall in love with it, and, uh, and be a steward of it. Um, this is me and my son, Amos. Um, again, I'm the private lands program manager, and, and what that means is that I coordinate the current use program and the work of the county foresters. Uh, in every county uh, throughout the state, there's a county forester who's an employee of the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation, whose job it is, is to uh, provide guidance and expertise to landowners on how to take care of their forests. Largely that advice that they provide is to larger landowners, but um, not a question when they get, get an invitation from a smaller landowner who is committed to taking care of their property, they will often get out to the property, walk with the landowner, uh, answer some questions. And so they are a resource uh, for, for any landowner. Um, so what is stewardship? And I, I think that these are, we're talking about stewardship projects, and uh, I think it's important to, to ask the question of what, is this, what does this even mean to be a, a stewardship project? And for me, stewardship is taking care of your woods for the range of things that they provide, habitat for wildlife, clean water, clean air, broader environment, things outside of ourselves. But at the same time, I think that this, uh, that stewardship is strongly rooted in the land ethic. And Aldo Leopold, a conservationist um, many years ago, said that the land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. We can be ethical only in relation to something we can see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith in. And for me, I feel like that's really why connecting with your land is the starting point for, um, for any stewardship project. In terms of importance of smaller properties um, in our each of our own backyards, uh, Vermont has 88,000 parcels that comprise the, the whole of the state. Of that, 48,000 are less than 10 acres. And one of the, uh, it's getting, it's approaching cliche right now, but the, one of the phrases that we hear over and over again in the Department 
forests are small forests are a big deal and this photo of, uh, of these many parcels illustrate that we've got the Winooski River uh, running through these parcels where this is used Montpelier and uh, the forest along the edges of this river between the waters they provide habitat for otters um, for nesting opportunities for ducks um, things like that but not one of these parcels on their own can provide that it's um, the collection of parcels and together that they provide that habitat value that clean water um, and so as I talk about the projects today I'm primarily going to be focused on what one person can do on their own property but I think it's really important to think about your property in relation to others um, that it is not an island uh, and that it, it exists in the context of many other parcels and that connectivity the connection or disconnection that any small parcel has from the next one um, can really impact the values that it provides uh, for wildlife for the ecological function functions like clean water uh, riding clean air but also humans uh, recreation trails and things like that um, but kind of diving back down into each individual's land um, in terms of how to how to become a steward of that land I think the first step is step is knowing and loving um, learning about what makes your land and what makes it special um, I think that the best choices for management on your land will get back to you and get back to a forest for, for years to come and so the, the first part of this presentation are some questions that you might be able to ask yourself to uh, begin to learn more about your land and what makes it special um, both objectively and, and personally um, and this is coming back to the basis of that that land ethic we can only be ethical in relation to something we can see feel understand love or otherwise have faith in uh, and so just talking again about nurturing that connection uh, this photo on the um, right hand side of your screen is an oven bird nest uh, those are little baby oven birds they you know hear them sometimes saying teacher 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 and this was uh, a little nest that I was really excited to find out in the woods one day um, they just make this little little nest uh, that almost looks like a uh, looks like an oven hence the name oven bird um, and this is one thing that upon discovering on your own property you might see it in a different light through a different lens um, and I encourage folks to look for this kind of thing or other other kind of things uh, so some of the questions you might ask yourself are what trees grow here uh, in this picture we've got a really large cherry tree uh, that Susie my wife is standing next to in the background we have a whole bunch of hemlock trees those are the, the evergreens in the back and they're really twisted and gnarly looking um, and they're all twisted and gnarly looking because they are being eaten by porcupines and so some of the sleuthing that you can do as a landowner to try to understand not just what's present but what's, uh, what's affecting the things that are present can help you understand the values of the, of the land that you're living on what animals can you find at night um, as humans and, I, and every other living thing we've got patterns and generally our pattern is to be outside during daylight uh, and experience our our land in the convenient times uh, but there's another part of part of the world that is using our land at different times of day and things that you might not see otherwise this is a juvenile gray tree frog that's on a, that's on a small property in Colchester uh, just sitting on a bracken fern um, and I wouldn't have wouldn't have run into him unless I was poking around at night again we're also often outside checking out small properties or 
check that land um, when it's really comfortable to be out there. Um, but there's this land is getting used um, during all different seasons. And so what you understand to be true about your own property uh, today and in this season may not be true, or something totally different might be true in the next season. And so its values uh, may really shine uh, in one season versus another. For instance, uh, a small property with a vernal pool in the spring uh, may be incredibly uh, loud and crawling with uh, little salamanders and frogs uh, in the spring, and then and then you just may not see those for the rest of the year. So just paying attention throughout the year um, to understand what you are supporting on your own land is is great opportunity. Hey, hey Keith, this is Kate. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, it sounds like uh, some of the participants are having a hard time hearing you, and I'm wondering, I'm almost wondering if maybe your speaker, your computer uh, microphone is picking up your sound as, as opposed to your headset. Um, okay. <clears throat> could you just double check on your sound? I'm going to do a sound check here. Yeah, I think I, that, that sounds a little bit clearer. Hmm. Just a moment here. How's this? Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Um, were people hearing me well enough to, to keep going from where I am right now? Yeah, I think it's okay to, get, to move forward. I just wanted okay. to make sure that, yeah. Great. Sorry about that, everybody. Everybody's saying much better. So okay. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's comments letting me know. Thanks, Keith. Sure. So um, bottom line, learn your land. And as you dive into projects on your own property, I encourage you to start with a light touch. Uh, Experiment with temporary changes. Watch how they work and progressively make bigger changes. When you live on a small piece of land, um, it may be ultimately that big changes can really make, have really positive impacts. But uh, a big change that doesn't quite play out the way you planned um, is something that you've got to live with for a long time. Um, and so I encourage people to to dabble before fully committing. Uh, the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about various projects and things that you can consider on your own property. Um, to start, I'm going to be talking about some stewardship activities for wildlife. Um, so dead trees are really important for wildlife. And I think one of the important things you can do is, is leave dead trees on your property. Um, there was a, a Facebook comment recently about the pileated woodpecker that was, uh, that was feeding and some concern about the, the health of the tree. And my response was that um, I think it's fair to have concern for the health of the tree, but that the concern shouldn't extend to the forest. Uh, in fact, the forest might be a little bit healthier. Um, because this tree is sick and dying. This uh, a tree that is now, that is sick and dying, becomes available to be food for wildlife. Um, and a tree that is providing that makes for a healthier forest, largely. Um, the, it is a balancing act. Uh, dead trees, especially on a small property, may not look as nice as uh, living trees, they can feel messy, um, and they can also be hazards. And so the retention of dead trees should be really in balance with a lot of other competing interests. But uh, as you consider the removal of the dead tree, know that it is uh, providing something very useful and valuable to uh, to wildlife. This is a a photo of a great horned owl I saw on a small property in Heinsburg. Um, 
that had uh, fledged from its nest, and I, I hope it made it back up, and I expect that it did. Um, this tree wouldn't have, or this bird wouldn't have been there unless there was a large dead pine that was standing behind it uh, where its nest was made. Dead trees also offer roosting habitat for bats, uh, and I mentioned food for woodpeckers as well. Um, Indiana bat is an endangered bat species. So it was, a lot of people are familiar with the white nose syndrome, and uh, Indiana bats were endangered before white nose syndrome hit. They're even more endangered now, um, and there aren't a lot of things that small landowners can do uh, but making sure that the habitat that they do provide to, to bats continues to be available um, is just one of the things that folks can do. The bats, uh, Indiana bat in particular, will crawl under loose bark. Uh, they call it exfoliating bark that is um, releasing itself but still attached to the tree. They climb under this like a blanket and um, up to 300 bats have been known to uh, to cluster together in a single tree, um, and so that can be valuable not just for a bat here and there, but for for an entire uh, maternity colony during the summer is when they're when they're most used in in Vermont. People also put out bat boxes, um, and bat boxes. There's good directions that come with them. You can just find them online. Um, People have had good luck with them, especially for certain bat species. Uh, big brown bat in particular uh, is one that uses them a lot. One of the easiest things that people can do are create brush piles. Um, because of the place that our forest is at right now, um, there's not a lot of dead stuff in the woods. We've got so many forests that are regenerating uh, after having been cleared that there's not a lot of dead material on the ground. And this dead material uh, is really important cover for rabbits, grouse, mice, weasels. Um, and so just cre simply creating a big brush pile uh, on a small property can be a place to for these animals to find some cover. It's really important to keep plants uh, that provide food, and so these would be mast trees and shrubs. Uh, mast is the it's the fruit of these trees, and there's hard mast and soft mast. Um, hard mast would be things like acorns or beech nuts. Soft mast would be things like raspberries or cherries, um, and the the hard mast often is a lot. Uh, has a lot more protein and fat to it, whereas the uh, soft mass often has a lot of sugar. Um, and the retention of these things, or the planting of them, uh, can can attract and, and support a lot of wildlife. One of the things that uh, kind of runs counter to a lot of people's aesthetic preference is the retention of low woody material, uh, low shrubs um, in their forest. It's, it obstructs views. Um, it's scratchy as you walk through it. Uh, and so there are some folks who really like to uh, clean it up. Um, however, there are some species like the black-throated blue warbler in this picture that will only nest 5 to 15 off the ground. And without those plants, those woody plants that are in that height range, we just won't have uh, some animals using our land. And so holding on to that uh, in the areas outside of our walking paths or um, areas where we, there's a, also the conflict with ticks at times uh, where, um, where we really need to be avoiding ticks, then um, retaining this low woody vegetation can be really good for, for wildlife use. This is an illustration developed by Audubon, 
um, which is really difficult to digest in a PowerPoint like this, uh, but it's just pointing out all of the different pieces of a forest that are contributing to uh, the habitat values. And so uh, we're talking streams and wet areas, uh, down big wood, um, we call it coarse woody material, or there's also fine woody material, uh, retaining softwoods, uh, cavity trees, retaining big trees and small trees, keeping openings and, uh, and also uh, shaded canopy. All of these things, this diversity supports, uh, a diversity of structure supports a diversity of wildlife. Bear scarred beach is one that may not be present on a lot of uh, small properties, but for folks who have small property that abuts uh, larger blocks of forest, um, this would be one really valuable tree to retain. In many cases, beaches are dying out as a result of beach scale nectria. Uh, it's an a invasive disease that's killed a lot of, a lot of beach over the past several decades. Um, but if you've got a healthy beach and it's getting used by bear, it's uh, it's one that gets used over and over and over again. And here's a, this is a beach in Underhill um, that has been used for years and years and years. Uh, so holding on to those um, in addition to other cherry trees or aspen or oak trees that, that animals are climbing to to get their food can be can be really great. And then softwood. Softwood um, it not only provides cover but in the winter it holds heat and so this can be really important for uh, not just deer but a whole bunch of other animals so um, especially if you've got a small island of, of softwood within an otherwise uh, hardwood dominated forest, holding on to softwood uh, like the structure creates a diversity and creates a habitat function that is just so important and, and much more rare than some other habitat values. So if you can, try to keep it where you've got it. Then maintaining connectivity. This is Going back to the um, the scales of of habitat uh, or the scale of um, benefits that small properties provide, a single small property may not provide habitat connectivity, uh, but multiple small small properties can do that. The habitat connectivity is the is uh, the ability of an animal to move from one habitat or one part of habitat to another. Barriers to that, that movement like roads or structures or open areas um, can limit uh, an animal's access to food, uh, to breeding grounds, uh, to uh, its ability to escape predators or other threats. Um, and so the extent that you can uh, create or maintain your land's contribution to connectivity is is a real gift um, to wildlife. Here's a, a good illustration of uh, how an animal might use a landscape. This is um, each of the yellow dots are a point from bobcat that was using land in Shelburne and um, I think one of the, the biggest stories here for me as it, as it relates to small properties is on the right hand side of the screen there are two arrows, air, excuse me, two arrows uh, indicating the shrub line and along this line um, on the left hand side of this, this uh, line we've got the the large wetland. On the right, in the center, we've got a whole bunch of agricultural land, and on the right hand side, we've got a large area of forest land. And while the bulk of the time of this bobcat was spent either in the wetland or in the upland, the main route that it took 
to move between these um, what would have been feeding habitat and denning habitat was just this narrow strip of shrubland and or this shrub line and so uh, I encourage folks not to underestimate the the value that a little bit of cover provides for the wildlife um, and it may not be wildlife that's on your own property it may be uh, the wildlife that's using adjacent property um, but that your the the value of your land can be uh, well your land can be invaluable um, for these species do we have any questions uh, for the wildlife portion Keith, I don't see any questions at the time at this time, uh, but just a good reminder for folks: as you have questions, uh, please go ahead and type them in the question box on the GoToWebinar side panel. Okay. I think we're good to keep going. Thank Great. you, Keith. So one of the um, one of the coolest things that folks can do on their own land is is uh, produce something from it. And that's one of the, uh, with the local VOR movement and the local craft movement uh, in Vermont, I think that that's uh, something that resonates with a lot of us. And the satisfaction we get from eating or using something that came from our land is, uh, it's, it makes both the creation of that or growing of that product um, and the, the use of it just that much richer. Uh, understanding that story behind it or the uh, the struggle you had developing it. Um, this is a perfect time of year for sugaring. Uh, there we go. Uh, so we're not getting a lot of sap flowing today, but I understand that right now this season is shaping up to be a really incredible sugaring year um, and for those who who haven't tapped any trees yet there's still time um, no hard work ever tasted so sweet uh, you can tap a maple uh, tree before the temperatures and the days get over 32 degrees uh, and when the sap tar starts to run just you can start boiling uh, some people will boil in their house some people will just set a pan right on their wood stove in their house um, other folks will eat, uh, boil down sap using a turkey fryer um, or just get a homemade or manufactured pan uh, I've seen a lot of neighbors tap trees among their houses and go in together on a, uh, a really fancy sugaring pan um, and with which you can really efficiently boil down sap um, which is uh, really satisfying it's a lot of fun to do with family um, and Saturday morning breakfasts are, are that much better for it uh, cutting trees um, for whatever uses you might have them for and uh, firewood is one that uh, whether it's whether it's for heating your home or uh, for camp wood something you can do also you can be cutting trees for um, just to support the growth of other trees one of the main principles we have as foresters is that cutting trees is not as much about what you're cutting as what you're growing and so identifying whenever you cut a tree and manage when you're managing for forests uh, you're managing for the growth of other trees or other objectives and so one of the main limiting factors for tree growth uh, or any plant growth is available sunlight and I'll just go back here uh, got a closed canopy uh, forest and then we've got a tree in the center and where trees around it have been cut and this tree in the center is the one that we want to retain and grow um, and so this is called crop tree release the landowner can do whatever they want with the remaining wood but the point in this case was to grow this tree and and that might be for uh, for a better
tree to tap and, and pull sap from. It might be because it's a cherry tree and it throws more cherries for wildlife. Um, it might be uh, because it's uh, a beech tree and then the bears are using it. But whatever the reason, the limiting factor for growth is sunlight. And if there's a tree that you're really excited about uh, thriving, um, cutting some trees around that to provide more sunlight can can help ensure that it that it does well. A tree that has a lot of sunlight isn't just growing faster and producing more seed or fruit or whatever it is. It's also more resilient to damage. It can deal with stresses better. Um, and so it's less likely to succumb to droughts or uh, or to other pests. Something that more and more people are doing lately is cultivating their own mushrooms. Uh, shiitake is one of the most easily grown mushrooms and uh, you can take a, a bolt about four feet long of, of oak or sugar maple or beech and uh, you can purchase what's called spawn, and you can just get that online, and you can either get uh, loose spawn or plugs and just drill holes into each of these logs and inoculate it with the, um, this spawn, which carries the, the fungus. And then you spread a little wax over that hole and uh, keep the wood moist, and... Um, they can produce for three years and you can get several pounds of mushrooms uh, uh, per log in some cases and people are doing that more and more. Cornell has a really good website um, that provides a lot of information about growing mushrooms and how-to guides. Other mushrooms that folks grow are oyster mushrooms or lion's mane. Um, those are the edibles and other folks are, are growing medicinals as well. Um, so this is, this is a lot of fun to do and, and a pretty reliable way to use a small area of your forest to, to produce a food that you enjoy. Then there's handicrafts. Um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of people who are just collecting things from their own property to create uh, to create a product and the harvesting of burls uh, from wood on your land, um, making walking sticks or materials like moss or bark are frequently used in crafting. Um, and it may be that some of the things from your land aren't even going to be used for crafts that you use. It might be that you know somebody else who would appreciate access to a, a nice burl for a um, for a wooden bowl uh, or things like that. Um, on the right hand side, this is a picture of uh, Peter Purrington's um, desk and Peter is a uh, sugar in Huntington and this is uh, wood that was um, tap hole maple uh, from his property and each of these holes and the staining above and below each hole is is what happens inside the wood uh, for lumber manufacturers this kind of wood is uh, is throwaway wood but for fine woodworkers this kind of wood tells a story and has a lot of character um, and I think it's pretty darn cool One of the things that we all love to do on on land, and I'm I'm sure everybody who's involved in this enjoys recreating in, in some way or another, uh, either on their own land or on the land of others. Um, campfires, trails, and bird watching are, although basic, uh, I think foundational to a lot of our enjoyment of the outdoors. Um, Having a space to be still in the woods and to connect with people in the place is uh, makes a huge difference. And in in my enjoyment, my personal enjoyment of my own land in Winooski, um, to be able to get out of the house and uh, unfortunately get bitten by a lot of bugs, but uh, but still to hang out in a different space 
um, feel the wind, see the moon and the stars, um, feels really special. And I think it's a great way to connect with your own land um, and the people who, who you invite to it. Trails, uh, of course, they offer a great opportunity for exercise, to explore your property with ease, and to see the natural world that your land supports. And uh, trails are something that on most small properties would be very difficult to do, uh, just because a small property by its nature uh, is very limited, whereas a trail is, is something that we expect to extend across some distance. Um, but I do think that uh, there are many properties where a small trail um, between properties, one that, that multiple landowners share, um, like a campfire, can create an opportunity not just to enjoy the space, but to uh, share the mutual benefits um, of the land. And it's a, so it's a great opportunity to, to cooperate and then, and then to, to see birds and, and all the other things that your land supports. Um, birding is something that, that more and more folks are paying, paying attention to and there's a really great birding community in Vermont. Um, there's a lot of opportunities on small properties and even in urban areas to see some really cool stuff. Uh, Audubon, Vermont has something called the Birders Dozen. Um, it's 12 what they call responsibility birds, birds that are really pretty common uh, but also really important uh, or really dependent on Vermont's forests. And if you're starting to starting off birding, understanding of these 12 birds um, would be a really great start to, uh, to your enjoyment as a birder. Um, there are also a bunch of apps available for phones and uh, if you're like me and just explore birding every now and then, dabble in it. I, I just tend to forget what a, exactly what distinguishes one bird from another or exactly what a bird sounds like. And so there are some apps for phones that have uh, the bird calls, have images of birds, um, have look-alike birds, uh, and they're just basically desk references for birds on your phone that are incredibly well designed and easy to explore. Um, and so I, 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 it's one of the, the most used apps on my phone when I'm out in the woods. It's just a ton of fun to play with. Um, so that I can, if I don't have it, I'll, I'll often see a bird and I'll say, huh, I wonder what that was, and I walk away. Uh, if I've got the app, I can understand not just what the bird is, uh, but I can also understand maybe why is the bird here, what is it using on this land, uh, and again, that discovery helps me appreciate something else about my land that I didn't understand before, and the uh, recognition that this bird is using it and why it's using it helps me appreciate it that much more. This is going back a little bit to that um, illustration. Here are the, the birders dozen uh, and each of these birds is using a different part of the forest. Scarlet tanager, eastern wood peewee, I'm looking at the top row here, blue-headed vireo, wood thrush. Um, again, they're each using a different element of the forest, uh, and I can't stress this enough, the maintenance of diversity, of structural diversity in, in your forest and in all forests really helps out the, the wildlife that depend on it. So when doing any project, uh, it's, there's no faster way to ruin your experience than, than to get injured in the process. Um, saw safety uh, are available, po recognizing poison ivy and understanding ticks. Um, there are chainsaw safety classes. Uh, game of logging is one and for all the courses that I've taken uh, 
this the game of logging was the most fun and most practical and and the biggest gift to my non-professional life um, that I've had and the, my level of comfort uh, in approaching a tree to cut it and do it safely uh, or or recognize when I can't do it safely has been uh, a real gift um, and so I'd encourage you to take the game of logging uh, the course that I was at there were several people who had never picked up a chainsaw in their life but they got a new job or something where they were required to understand how to do this um, and in the first day they were dropping leaning trees on a pin in the ground 30 feet away and uh, so the approach that they take in these courses is really fantastic they basically provide you a recipe and they provide you the skills to to follow that recipe and it just becomes they make it very basic and very simple which allow you to be very confident in your approach and in, in cutting down trees Known your poisonous plants um, I, uh, I learned a, an awful lesson when I chose to weed whack an acre of poison ivy in my flip-flops and then go away on a camping trip for three days with no shower and um, I knew poison ivy after that um, poison sumac poison ivy there's a whole bunch of other poisonous plants that are out there now um, that it's just really worth paying attention to um, so recognize these plants uh, and ticks uh, are more and more of a problem in Vermont uh, Lyme disease is the most uh, common disease associated with ticks but there's a whole bunch of others and um, much less common but some more dangerous than uh, than Lyme and there was a recent article on uh, or a story that NPR had about about ticks in the Northeast ticks are strongly associated with uh, white-footed mice and um, and so their populations uh, are going up and up uh, in part because of the the development that's occurring and the fragmentation that's occurring um, but they're supporting the the movement of tick populations in a major way and so there's there are some folks who strongly recommend to just stay out of the woods um, and and avoid hiking or um, being in nature and I really think that that's personally the uh, not the solution that I want to be advocating I think it's really important that people do get out in their woods but also to understand the risks uh, when they're out there and do tick checks uh, know what they look like uh, pull ticks out as soon as they see them um, there are other ways to manage for ticks in the environment and I, I encourage people to take it seriously the um, there are more and more cases of Lyme but also with people are understanding that the incidence of Lyme in uh, within ticks is pretty high and it's often uh, the case that more than 80 percent of ticks in certain areas in Vermont carry Lyme um, and so recognizing that that it's that frequent helps us to appreciate how much of a risk it can be I will say that uh, with that high of a frequency in um, even in Chittenden County where I've worked there have been years where I've had several um, on the order of 20 embedded ticks in a year and because of tick checks and quick removal of ticks I've never contracted Lyme um, I don't doubt that some of the ticks that were embedded carried it um, so I, I just want to stress the, the importance of doing the tick checks the one of the things that we're struggling with in Vermont um, and is really 
a problem on smaller properties are invasive plants. And invasive plants are a problem because they can grow so quickly, they can spread so quickly, they can really limit the diversity in a forest, uh, they can limit the ability of native plants to establish or um, availability of native foods for native wildlife or insects or things like that. And so I really encourage people uh, where possible to approach, uh, to try to control the invasive plants. And in every case, we're not going to be able to just eradicate it. Um, but depending on the, the numbers and the kind of plant uh, that's invading, we can, we can do our best to make sure that native plants are getting established and the, the animals that depend on them have availability, have food availability and, and what they need. Um, vtinvasives.org is a resource that um, developed by the state that's really great for understanding what invasive plants are out there, what they look like, uh, how to distinguish them from other lookalikes, and how to control them. So again, that's vtinvasives.org. I think it's something that every landowner, uh, a resource that every landowner should be aware of. Um, as a as a forester walking around and recognizing areas where there's really dense infestations of invasive plants, I couldn't help but think that at some point during the spread of this plant, it could have been controllable. It could have been stopped. And if somebody had recognized when there were just a handful of plants that if they just yanked them, they could have uh, prevented a real problem uh, or what I see as a real tragedy, a uh, loss of basically a native ecosystem in an area. So prevention is the, is the biggest step, knowing what's in the area, knowing what species are using an area uh, and if one or two get established, you get rid of them quickly. Um, a small patch of invasive plants can be eliminated before it becomes a problem. In this image in the foreground, uh, there's some small cattails that are just emerging. In the background, we have some tall, dried out fronds of Phragmites. Uh, Phragmites is a beautiful grass. Uh, it can grow six feet tall, but at the same time, it can crowd out all other vegetation. Um, once this crowds out that other vegetation, this is often occurring in wetlands and things like that, um, that diversity is gone and we don't have a lot of native species that use uh, dense patches of Phragmites. Um, and so again, controlling it before it becomes a problem is uh, a real contribution to not just the, the ecological value of your land but uh, also every infestation is a source, a potential source for new infestations. By preventing it, establishment of invasive plants on your own land, you may be preventing establishment on other properties. Where invasive plants are well established, control the spread. Uh, this is a property in Huntington where barberry was really well established. Barberry supports habitat for white-footed mice. Um, Again, white-footed mice are strongly associated with uh, tick abundance, and so, therefore, barberry supports ticks. Um, this is a, a plant that a lot of people have uh, used ornamentally, um, and because of that, it's pretty common, and where it goes wild, it goes wild, uh, and it's one that uh, is, can be pulled. It responds well to burning. Um, and is very responsive to herbicides if, uh, and at times that's a, can be a very appropriate tool to use to control something that is an otherwise, um, can do a lot more damage to the environment. Um, control of spread can involve understanding where it's at today and kind of drawing a line in the sand where you say, I'm just going to make sure that I don't let it spread beyond this or I'm just going to make sure that uh, 
this plant doesn't produce seeds and immature plants uh, may grow several years before they produce seeds and um, when you begin to see that if you cut those seed producing stems it may just be that you can peck away and keep the seed production to a minimum and that it really doesn't spread beyond the uh, beyond the isolated problem that you've got. So just a, a recap here um, stewardship, stewardship activities for wildlife retain dead trees. Um, they're really important for, uh, for a lot of wildlife, bats, woodpeckers, um, owls, things like that. So leave standing dead trees and falling trees where they don't pose a, pose a hazard. Create brush piles. They can provide a lot of cover for critters like rabbits, squirrels, and mink. Uh, food. Keep trees and other plants growing that produce mast uh, or shrubs for birds and other animals that are de dependent on their food. And maintain cover and connect connectivity on your land, recognizing that your land is uh, might be a link in a in a important habitat. With it might be that shrub line between a wetland and a um, upland forest and so maintaining that connectivity, maintaining vegetation on your land can keep that cover in place and keep it valuable for, for wildlife that are using it. For products, uh, sugaring, you could go out and uh, tap some trees this weekend and you'd probably have several good runs still uh, to collect sap um, and boil that down and have some maple syrup. You can harvest your own firewood uh, by cutting trees but Remember that when you're cutting trees, it's important to focus on what you're growing, not what you're cutting. As long as you focus on gr what you're growing, you're always going to be producing something new and valuable in your, in your woods. If you focus on what you're cutting, it may be that one day you run out of things to cut and, and that's the end. So focus on what you're growing. Uh, you can grow mushrooms. Uh, again, shiitake, uh, oyster, and lion's mane are some common mushrooms that folks are growing. All three of those are just absolutely delicious. Uh, the Cornell website has a lot of resources associated with uh, growing mushrooms, and there's a whole bunch of places where you can buy um, mushroom spawn, uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of websites. Then handicrafts, uh, just understanding what what resources on your land, um, whether it's grapevines or moss or things for walking sticks or burls for a woodworker, um, might be tools that you can use or might be materials that you can use to, to create something cool. Building a campfire ring, creating a trail with neighbors or bird watching um, is a great, are all great opportunities for, for recreation and and really connecting with your neighbors or, or your friends on, on your land. Again, do it all safely. Uh, Game of Logging is the SAW safety course that um, is the standard in Vermont. No experience is required. It's just a blast and if you ever want to pick up a chainsaw, I think it's just a, a really um, great experience to have. Recognizing poisonous plants, poison ivy and, and um, poison sumac and several others and and really understanding that ticks are a major problem in Vermont uh, increasingly so and that whenever you're out in the woods uh, do a tick check when you come back um, not something that you'll ever regret doing I'm sure uh, and then when you're on your property, paying attention to invasive plants, look at vtinvasives.org uh, to understand what plants are in the area, um, what they look like, how to identify them, and how to control them. Uh, be vigilant in preventing them. Once you understand them, if you recognize that they're on your property, make sure that they aren't a problem. If they're already really well established, um, try to control them uh, and limit their spread. Um, try to prevent your property from being a source of spread to other properties. And with that, that concludes my show, my presentation. Um,
we've got some time for some questions, so if, if we've got any, I'd be happy to to respond. Great. Thank you so much, Keith. And uh, we do actually have a question that's come in, and uh, so I'll go ahead and read this off in just a second here. Uh, but as I read this off, just a reminder to other folks uh, that if you have any questions or even comments, um, you know, feel free to use the question uh, function in the GoToWebinar in order to raise a question or share maybe uh, some ideas or thoughts that you're having in terms of projects for your woods. So the question that we have is from David, and it is uh, it starts off with a comment. He says, I have beavers on my... Uh, who have built a dam on my property. I love to watch them in the spring and summer, but they also have made it very difficult to get to uh, get to get on foot to different parts of my property. Uh, Keith, any thoughts for David on on um, interacting with beavers? Yeah, so and, and possibly uh, managing. <laughs> um, <laughs> people have struggled with this this a, a fair bit, and there's something uh, called a beaver baffle that uh, allows the beavers to remain but keeps um, keeps the water levels controlled and basically what it is is a culvert or a tunnel that's inserted into the dam that uh, has a um, has a box at the end that's uh, kind of a wire mesh um, which is really difficult to plug up it requires some maintenance um, there are designs for this on the internet quite a bit, um, but it, uh, for somebody who loves the beavers, wants them to stay, but wants to limit the nuisance that they're causing, um, that's one way to one way to deal with it. Um, other ways uh, on my own property, this is more anecdotal than scientifically proven, but as a kid, we had a had a pond, and the beavers kept plugging up the, the outlet, uh, we did not want them to stay, but we also didn't want to, to hurt them. Uh, we may have hurt them, though, because we played loud country music for 72 hours uh, through a loudspeaker, uh, and our thought was, was that the, uh, the noise uh, would aggravate them, and, and they did end up leaving. That's funny. Uh, um, well, that's that's great, Keith. Thank you so much for the answer on that. You know, on, um, uh, another question has come in here on bat boxes uh, from Alicia. Uh, Alicia, Alyssa, I guess it is. Um, let's see here. I've heard it can be can take bats a while to find a box. Is that true? Uh, she says here that we've they've put up a couple. They put up one a couple of years ago, but hadn't noticed any ba uh, bats using it yet. How long should I wait before I move it? You know, I, I don't know the exact answer on that. I do know it can take a while. Um, I'm not a not a bat expert, but I, I know that there are far fewer bats than there have ever been in Vermont. Um, and I think that looking at the tools that are available online and just double checking that you've got the right, uh, that it's facing the right direction, that it's on the right height and on the right material, um, that can all those factors can play a role but at the same time bats are such social creatures that uh, it may be that there's a lot of competition I don't know if bats are in your attic or things like that if there's much more suitable places nearby for bats it may be that um, uh, a bat box isn't high on the list and in some places that's the case hey. Yeah, to say, Keith, you know, and you had mentioned in your presentation that there was one species that was more likely to use a bat box. Was uh, the large brown bat? Is that what you shared? Big brown bat, is my understanding, is more more likely to use a bat box, and it's much less impacted by white nose syndrome. It remains pretty common in the state, uh, despite white nose syndrome. Okay. Well, uh, thanks. That's a great question. I will. Uh, I can also try to pull together some additional information on bats and bat boxes. I don't think there's too much right now in the uh, the current online module. So I will pull together some information for folks and email that out, that out um, in a day or so. Uh, let's see here, Keith. There's a few more uh, just questions here. Um, 
a note from Joanne. Thank you. You've inspired to uh, develop a reasonable approach to deal with my knotweed and wild chervil problem. So just a comment of thanks nice. there. And then Kate has a comment here. Um, I have a good size acreage of woods. I'm mostly interested in keeping my woods healthy. Is it necessary to thin the woods or can they take care of themselves? They can take care of themselves. The, uh, the, I, I think that the true exception to that is uh, invasive plants. Um, the, the want to harvest trees is, um, it's important for people to keep their extraction of materials in balance. Um, and, and so you can, if you want the forest to produce products and remain healthy, it may be that you need to thin. Uh, if you don't want to extract products, the forest, I mean, before we came, the forest took care of the cells for a long time. Um, I will say that I mentioned a lot about structure and its contribution to wildlife habitat, um, particularly interior forest birds and things like that. It could be that if you don't have large trees or you don't have dead wood on the ground that you can jump start that process not by cutting and removing trees but by cutting trees and leaving them on the ground uh, or things like that. You can create the structure that older forests have um, by doing some cutting that mimics that, uh, that structure that eventually develops in very old and very healthy forests. Great. Well, thanks again, Keith, for joining us this evening. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to share such a great overview of, of all the possibilities uh, for folks in their backyard woods. Uh, and so for uh, participants this evening, um, again, thank you for participating and for, um, for taking advantage of the course and the, the webinar presentation tonight. Uh, just a reminder that we did kick off Module 3 today, and um, there'll be lots more information available on many of the topics that Keith uh, touched on uh, as a part of the online learning module this week. And again, uh, you know, since Gwen will be out of town this week, uh, if you have any questions, please, or, or thoughts, feel free to get a hold of me directly. Um, and I think that's, that'll do it for this evening's presentation. Thanks again, Keith, for taking the time to join us, and, uh, and enjoy the module, folks. Thanks, everybody.